for his goodness and for his grace. December month is uh, such a wonderful and exciting month of the year, isn't it? Isn't it? Sure it is, sure it is. It's Christmas time, and I like to, uh, I like to celebrate Christmas, not just uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, but I like to celebrate Christmas for most of the month, and uh, love some, some things, don't have a whole lot of traditions, but just, just love the season. You see, um, I find that people are, uh, for some reason or other, uh, while they're under pressure and while they're under stress, they are also somewhat pleasant during this December month. I think the season just brings that kind of uh, joy and that kind of expression. And of course, it, December is the time to give gifts and to receive gifts. And well, receiving gifts are more fun, that's for sure. And uh, then, of course, it moves by so quickly. And everyone seems to be so happy and fulfilled with joy and cheer and good wishes. And for most people, there's a few days off extra. If you just get to Christmas Day and Boxing Day or and a half of Christmas Eve, you've got a little extra time. And sometimes if you've got a really generous employer, they might give you a few days after Boxing Day to be off. So there's a sense of, of joy and and you just wish December could stay around for a while, but the truth is January comes. And with January, a new year starts. And we begin to wonder, what does a new year hold? What, what's, 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 what's in it? What, what does God know about our new year that we don't know? A whole lot of things. And we trust that there's not too many surprises. But a new year starts in January. And then the bills from all that money we spent in December begin to roll in. It's really interesting, isn't it, that, that Visa have never yet, yet lost anybody's address. You ever notice that? Never, never lost anybody's address. And suddenly we realize when the bills arrive that we have a fresh awareness of this truth that our investments in the bank you gotta, you got to get your banker down on the floor, put your knee in his back, hold his, both his hands behind him to get 1% on your, of interest on your investments. But when your bill arrives in January, you realize that Visa is charging 21% interest. You ever notice that? I'd like to be in charge of the Bank of Canada for a little while. i got a few rules I'd like to make. One would be that you can't charge double interest over, over what you're giving as an, on an investment. That would be a good place to start with. So the truth is, how do we avoid, avoid all of these kind of uh, contrasts? How do we avoid all of this totally opposite contrast from December month to January month? How do we, how do we move from the joy of December to the agony of January and deal with it in our personal lives. Well, I'd like to suggest this morning that we take a different perspective or see things from a different perspective than what we normally see things as. So I'm going to tell you a little Christmas story from the Word of God. but. We're going to, I'm going to tell the story by the help of the Lord through the eyes of a Bible character who rarely gets mentioned during the Christmas season. This Christmas story has no angels, has no shepherds, has no wise men or wise women. Has no cradles, no shining stars, no flocks of sheep, no gifts of gold, frankincense, or myrrh. This Christmas story has no baby in a manger, no Christmas carols being sung, no bright lights, and definitely no Santa Claus. 
Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2. Usually when we talk about the Christmas story, we go to Matthew and Luke, but it's mostly Luke chapter 1 and the first couple of chapters of Matthew. I was thinking this morning and thinking this week, thinking this weekend about the whole concept of Christmas and what has happened to it over the last 50, maybe 75 years. And the Christmas that we normally see is a Christmas of stress and strain and, 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 and frustration uh, because the demands of society have changed so much that we got to keep up with the Joneses whether we like the Joneses or not. And we got to do this and we got to do something else. So that to the point when if you really talk to most people and they are really honest, most people are glad when Christmas is past. Most people are glad when Christmas is past because of the, all the stress and the strain and the responsibility and the busyness and the season slips by us so very, very quickly. However, in the book of Luke, there's a whole different approach to what happened on Christmas. I'd like to share four concepts with you this morning through the eyesight or through the eyes of a godly man whose name was Simeon. In chapter 2 of Luke, verse 21, down to the 35th verse, we meet him in a very fascinating manner. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, referring, of course, to Mary, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Let me just pause there and tell you, at that time, Jesus was 41 days old. He was one day short of six weeks. He was 41 days. You will find the supporting documents for that in the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, in particular. The 23rd is a reference to a prophecy, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So that Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's the reason why we realize that we know from the word of God that Mary and Joseph were, were just common poor folk. And that's the reason why they were allowed to offer just the two turtle doves and the two pigeons in, instead of a, a larger, more expensive gift. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, or, or we, what we would call Simon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. This gentleman, Simeon, only appears here in this particular context. But he was indeed an incredible man of God, filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. On the 27th verse it says, He came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant die. That's really what it means there. Now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Incredible which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles 
and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things. Imagine this morning, as I dedicated this baby, if I had started quoting some profound scriptures and said, Lord, now thy servant is ready to retire, for I have seen your face in this child, and I have seen the sign that you have given me. Wouldn't everybody be saying, how do you know that? The truth is, the Holy Spirit had shown Simeon that they would come. And he saw through his natural eyes incredible spiritual truths. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simon blessed them and said unto, and said unto Mary, Simon blessed them and, 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 and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign sh that shall be spoken against. And then he looked at Mary and said, Yes, Mary, indeed, a sword shall pierce to your own soul. It doesn't sound like a, a, a celebration of a dedication, does it? That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Keep in mind now, we are only 44, uh, 41 days away from that incredible moment in Bethlehem, less than six weeks away from that incredible moment in Bethlehem when, when the angels were singing and, the, and the, the, the shepherds came and brought their gifts and all that is associated with Christmas. We're about a mere six weeks away from that. And Simeon puts the Christmas story in its absolute proper perspective. See, what we have done over the centuries, and the Christian church is brutally responsible for this, brutally responsible for this, we have, we have created Santa Claus, we put him on some reindeer, and we've made the arrival of Santa Claus on a reindeer far, far more exciting for our children than the coming of Christ. We didn't intend that. Decades before we were born, centuries before we came into existence, the church made this incredible ungodly switch where Santa Claus became the focus of Christmas. And a reindeer with a red nose named Rudolph is the most popular song sung during Christmas instead of a song reflecting the coming of Christ. That's just what's happened. And so, having bought into the Christmas fiasco, uh, merchants do their thing. And, and, and all kinds of Money is spent for gifts we don't need to give to people we don't particularly like. But it's Christmas time. And we buy into the stress of Christmas. And look, I appreciate Christmas. I um, love the Christmas season mostly because people's personalities change. Yeah. People's personalities change during, during December month. But don't get too comfortable. They'll change back again in January. It's just human nature. When the time comes to pay the bills. But here, six months after the coming of Christ, God began, was showing Simeon and spoke to Joseph and Mary from another perspective completely. And I believe that the church should begin to get this perspective more than the perspective of the spectacle that, that, that encompasses all the traditions we have of Christmas and we put Jesus there in a little space so that we, our conscience are eased. Yeah, that's true. But you see, the wonder of Christmas is not a baby in a manger, but Christ on the cross. That's the wonder of Christmas. 
It's not, it's not all the fluff and the, even the fluff in the church. The, the wonder of Christmas is, is, is the fact that Christ is on the cross. And, and so Simeon would say to her, now, now, we of the more sophisticated type would say, my, we would have preferred Simeon to be a little more politically correct. And we would, we would, we would have loved for him to be a little more sensitive. After all, here's a young mom, 12 or 13 years old, and, and she's so happy with this child. And, and here comes this old man, Simeon, and, and, and he says to her, he says, this child is going to pierce your soul. What's going to happen is going to pierce your soul in this child. Like, he's not exactly like a, a positive thinker, is he? But the truth is, he was being truthful. He was being truthful. Somehow or other, I believe I got your attention this morning. See, the wonder of Christmas is not a child being born to live and grow up, but God coming down to die and rise up. The scripture says he was slain from the foundations of the world. He wasn't caught in some kind of Jewish riot or some kind of Jewish era. The, God prepared that era for the coming of his son, Jesus. One of the greatest smiles that come on my face uh, when I hear about paganism doing this and doing that, we know that paganism actually accommodated the Word of God. For, for Cyrenius called for the, for the census that would bring Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem, where Jesus would be born fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. Don't you just love it? I've been reading so much in the Old Testament lately, and, 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 and here God again just confirms that he, he controls the destinies of our world. Child of God, we don't have the thing to worry about. Don't you fuss over nuclear di di discussions in Iran. Don't you fuss over a Middle East going up in flames because Syria is in trouble and Egypt is in trouble. Don't you fuss about that. The God that we serve has everything under control. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> While the Caesars would have laughed at the idea of Israel's God, at the same time they were declaring a census that will fulfill the word of God. Now if that's not funny, I don't know what is. You say, Pastor, you've got a weird sense of humor. Yes, I do. I laugh at the wisdom of the world that tries to short-circuit God, and in their wisdom, they fulfill His will. Amen. Think about it. It's incredible. Jesus, being just 41 days old, was brought into the temple to be to be carry out the ritual that we read here in the scriptures. You see, Simeon saw things in the spirit because he was just, devout, expecting. And Luke chapter, 20, chapter 2, verses 25 to 27 says, he had the Holy Spirit upon him. He had the Holy Spirit upon him. Well, let me show you four things that's that Simon or Simeon saw. That puts Christmas into a different perspective. Now, I'm not trying by any means to, to, to damp your excitement about Christmas. I just want to put it in the proper perspective. I, I, don't, I don't want the church to get caught up with the same silly values that the world has. I just don't want that. I, I think it's, 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 it insults the good grace of God. But there's four things that Simeon saw that puts everything in perspective for us about this Christmas season that helps us to enjoy this Christmas season more than anybody else. Because you see, the truth is, for the world, when Christmas, when the 12 days of Christmas are gone, they're gone. And people go back to being their old grumpy self, moaning and complaining about the traffic jams and having to go to work. Moan them, complain about how desperate life is and don't know if they can make it or not. Do you understand this truth? That after Christmas, hordes of people will commit suicide because they come down from a high of that seasonal excitement to the dull drums of their ordinary life. 
But folks, when we get the right perspective on what Christmas really is, we will find a freedom that transcends our calendar, our season, and our festivities. Simeon saw this truth that this child was appointed to be God's salvation. Here in the text, in the 30th verse, he said, Mine eyes have seen your salvation. Now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, Luke, the writer, says, Jesus being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Isn't that something? When, when they thought they were getting rid of him, they were fulfilling God's plan. I say to you as believers this morning, we are safe in the hands of the Lord. Nothing's going to befall us that God is not able to deal with. Amen. And so often these trials come for our strengthening, for our maturity, for our spiritual growth. See, God is more interested in our spiritual growth than our physical comforts. Wow. Let me say that again. God is more interested in our, in our spiritual growth than he is in our physical comforts. How often does God hear us say, God, give me, give me, give me. I'd like to have, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm claiming this, Lord. I'm claiming this. Compared to praying, oh, God. Mold me and shape me according to your will. Change my mind, Lord, into a way that thinks more like you. Fill my heart, Lord, with passion for the things that you are passionate about. I believe that's the key to, to moving forward in our walk with God. So therefore, Sam, Simeon saw that he was the only way to God. He saw it. It, this is, this is, I have seen your salvation, Lord. I have seen your salvation. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says that there is, no, there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. That's important. Number two, Simeon saw the child, God's salvation, was prepared for all people. See, this is a, you, you and I don't understand the, the, the incredible truth that Simeon stated here because we didn't live in that particular era. And so it was, it, was, it was an incredible truth for the Jewish people would have grown up believing that they, being chosen of God, were the only ones that God cared about. That would be the general overview. We are God's people and, 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 and those Heathen and those Hamorites and those Hedomites and all of those other ites, uh, they, 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 they don't have any, any, anything to do with our God. They're true on that, but God had a plan in place. God had a plan in place. And so the Jewish thought, particularly with Simeon, would be that only the Jews that were God were interested in, only Israel that God was interested in. But Simeon saw as he held that baby and saw Jesus, he realized by the Spirit that this was the salvation for all people, for, for his people Israel and for the Gentiles. Isn't that an incredible truth? That's, that's, that's mind-boggling for that era. That, that's groundbreaking for him to, dis, to declare this particular truth here in the 31st and the 33rd. Let's read them. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. This is what Simeon saw in the Christmas story, although he knew he had no connection with this idea of Christmas at all. He saw that the child was, was, was God's salvation for all people. What a great message today that we have to preach. What a great message in a very multicultural city, in a very multicultural nation, that we can, we can sit and have coffee with any culture, with any group, with any nationality, and we declare unto them that Jesus loves them. 
I love this inclusive message. I love this inclusive message that no matter what sin is in your life, no matter what sin is in my life, uh, I am included in the grace of God. I am not excluded because of my gender or my, or my race or my sin. I am included by the grace of God. What a great message. So that's a showstopper for those who want to get into this argument. Oh, yeah, you guys think you're special. No, everyone who receives Christ as Lord and Savior are special. In fact, those who have not received him are still special, so special that he came in flesh. And what a great message to tell. What a great evangelism over coffee to say no matter where you are, what you've done, who you are, what your background is, we are one before God, and he came to save in Christ Jesus all people. Oh, what a powerful insight that Simeon had. For there were many in Israel who rejected everybody outside of that covenant. But Simeon said, ah, this is for all people. You see, he was born of Jewish parents. He came to a Jewish nation. He lived amongst the Jewish people. He observed the Jewish law. But he came to die and be the savior of all people everywhere. I'm not Jewish. I may have a nose that looks it, but I'm not. I am not Jewish. I am, I've been told that I look Jewish. I am not Jewish, but I was included. Those of you that are not Jewish by, by ethnic background, you were included in the wonderful message of God's love on that day, amen. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about us being included in the covenant of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Who are the Greeks? The Greeks are all non-Jews, Gentiles, us. That's what the word encompasses here in this particular passage of Scripture in Romans 1 and 16. Simeon saw that this child was God's salvation for all people. That's an incredible reason to celebrate Christmas, isn't it? So on Christmas morning when we get up, we realize that we have received the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, and that's the greatest gift we can have. Well, what did you get for Christmas? I know the question is going to be asked millions of times uh, on Christmas Day and the next day or so afterwards, and particularly after you go back to work, if you work in an office or a factory or wherever it might be. What did you get for Christmas? Oh, folk, we have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. We receive the babe of Bethlehem's manger. That's our primary Christmas gift. The scripture says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hear what it says here none are excluded. So we can throw out the theory of predestination. The only thing that was predestined was the plan and not people. God predestined the plan in eternity that Christ would come and all who would believe upon him would be saved. He didn't didn't predestine that some people were saved to be saved and some people were were to be lost. No, he predestined the plan and in time he came And all who believe on him are saved. See, there's a theory out there that says if you've been predestined for salvation, no matter what you do, you're going to have salvation. And the flip side of that coin is that no matter how good you lived, you weren't included. So forget about it. But I want to clarify something this morning. The only thing that was predestined was the plan. God predestined the plan in Christ so that all will believe on him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, not whosoever was in the plan, whosoever of their own volition and will would be saved. What an incredible gift. 
How sad it would be this morning if, if the gift of Christ during Christmas was only for a select few. Think about it for a few moments. How sad that would be. But you see, he came for all. And, the, and, and, and what our response is to believe on him. To believe on him. Definitely. See, prejudice and favoritism are unknown to God. First John chapter 2, verse 2, says Jesus died for the whole world. The whole world. Third thing that Simeon saw was the child would be a light to the world. And how is Jesus a light to the world? Simply by this truth, that he would reveal God. He would reveal God. Isn't it interesting today that, that, that millions and millions and tens of millions and, t and more than that people on this earth are spending all kinds of time, energy, and finances trying to find meaning in life? They buy things, they sell things, they do things, they stop doing things, they do other things, they do all of these sort of things. Looking for that spiritual fulfillment, looking for that assurance of something after death, looking for that, that sense of, of belonging, sense of meaning, giving life purpose. And all the while they forget this truth or they are, are ignorant to the truth that Jesus Christ came to bring life and that abundant life. Yes. Think about it for a moment. Folks, it's not just the baby in Bethlehem's manger. He's a Christ that died on the cross and said, whosoever will may come. It's not doesn't say whosoever can come will. It says, whosoever will may come. That's the reason why we can stand and declare the message of God's salvation to every human being, no matter what race, color, or language. Amen. Amen. Folk, the truth is, we have the license from the Word of God to declare that God loved everybody. That's what Christmas was all about. He gave His Son to the world. Yes, yes, He came through a little Jewish lady. He came through a Jewish nation. We understand all of these incredible truths, not all of them, and we don't understand them fully, but we understand them from the perspective that we can in Abraham and all in Israel. And then when he came, he came for you and I. That's what Simeon was seeing in that incredible day. That was Simeon's perspective of what we call Christmas. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6 when he was talking to Thomas, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No person comes to the Father but by me. You see, today our world staggers and stumbles about in darkness. Folk, we're living in a dysfunctional world. Never mind what the politicians tell you. Never mind what the bankers tell you. Never mind that the, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has gone over 16,000. Never mind that NASDAQ is higher than it ever was before. Never mind about this perceived prosperity. We are in a crisis. Our world is in a crisis, and it's being prepared for the rule of Antichrist. It's being prepared for the rule of Antichrist. Governments are putting in place universal policies. Nations are getting together and burying the action, to, not in their backs, but putting it in documents. Uh, and, uh, and we would say, oh, how beautiful that is. The nations are coming together. They're coming together to prepare for the rule of Antichrist. Anybody who reads the Word of God, anybody who spends time in the presence of God in prayer will suddenly begin to realize uh, that this is an unusual time, and it's a time when the world is looking for an answer, and the answer for the world will be Antichrist. Antichrist. But you see, the reason that such chaos exists in the world today is not because they do not believe in God. You talk to the European nations, you talk to the Western nations, you talk to some nations that are kind of nowhere, and they will, they will, they will acknowledge some sense of God. 
They're not in a quagmire because they don't recognize God or believe in God. They're in a quagmire because they have rejected Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the defining moment and the defining person between all of the isms of the world, all of the philosophies of the world. If people could begin to believe on Jesus Christ, you'd see a lot of things change. And so Simeon saw that. He saw that Jesus was the light of the world. He is the light. The world in darkness because she refuses to acknowledge Jesus Christ, to believe and accept the truth about Jesus Christ. He is the demarcation point in, po in politics, in philosophy, and in religion. You can go to any university, and you can talk about all the great monotheistic and dualistic philosophies, and you'll have a general agreement, a general understanding. They won't necessarily accept each other's views, but they can make, they'll make room for them. But let a Christian young person stand up and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. That young person is castigated. That young person, him or her, is identified and is singled out by professors, by, by college policy, because they dare to mention Jesus Christ. That should tell you something. That we live in a world that have rejected Christ. And therefore, Christ, the world is in darkness. Simeon saw that. Because he saw that Jesus was the light of the world. And when you reject the light, and it's the only light there is, then you choose darkness. Many have gone searching after other things after rejecting Christ only to live a life of confusion and die sometimes at their own hand with no sense of fulfillment. I'm here to declare this morning that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. John chapter 8 verse 12, he said, Jesus spoke again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 12 and 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Folk, every one of us should be a point of light in our neighborhood. Every one of us should be a point of light at our place of work. Every one of us should be a point of light in our, in our province and in our community because we have the light in us. Not because we're of any value of ourselves, but the light gives us that value. Amen. We're not better than other people. And it comes to the human sense. But when Christ dwells within us, he has, he has received us. And now we begin to emanate that light of Christ. Amen. We are the light of the world because Christ shines through us. I'm not being exclusive this morning. I'm just being truthful. We are the light of the world because Christ shines through us. And if he's not shining through us, we need to clean up our chimneys a little bit. We need to brush up our lives according to the Word of God. The fourth thing that Simeon saw was absolutely shocking to Mary and Joseph. He saw the suffering and death of Jesus. In verses 34 and 35 of our text, let's read it again. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rise again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword shall perish to your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon saw the suffering and the death of Jesus. See, scriptures show a good record of how Christ was objected against and finally rejected and crucified. See, here's the problem with the first Christmas story. Many people want to keep Jesus as a little baby in a manger that they can visit once a year. And the truth is, far too many Christians fall in that category. Oh, I'm a Christian. Um, who do you fellowship with? Well, 
I go to church. Yeah, so who's your pastor? Hmm. I've had that happen to me. Folk trying to impress me. And uh, yeah, literally, literally. Oh, yeah, yeah, I go to church and oh, I said, and who's your pastor? Hmm. And they couldn't tell me their pastor's name. <laughs> kind of funny, eh? Kind of funny. You see, for many, Christianity is one day a year. When they go to church on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or sometime during the Christmas season of, 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 of 12, 15 days. And then they just want to just kind of package Jesus up, put him in the cellar, or put him in the closet, put him in a room that they won't need until next Christmas season. But I'm a Christian. I'm a follower. It's really time that we understood how all of this happened and that we sorted our priorities in this time of the year. Simon saw the suffering and death of Jesus. You see, they preferred, preferred a murderer called Barabbas in Jesus' place. But they want to keep him in the manger. See, the wonder of Christmas is captivating the significance of the communion service that was first instituted by Jesus on the night of betrayal and given to the Apostle Paul for the church in 1 Corinthians. The whole story of Christmas is wrapped up in the communion service where Christ came and gave his life. That you and I might be reconciled to God. That's what Christmas is about. And I would challenge, I would challenge all of us. Let's give our greatest gift this Christmas to Christ. And that gift is the gift of ourself. The world calls for my attention, it calls for your attention, it calls for my energy, it calls for your energy, it calls for your, my, 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 my giftings, it, it calls for your giftings. It calls for my time, it calls for your time. But I'm saying this, this Christmas and this new year that they're facing if the Lord tarries, let's give him ourselves. Say, Lord... You have the priority in my life. You came, you condescended, you wrapped yourself in flesh, you were born of a, 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 a virgin mother, you grew up and you were rejected, and you, you died for me and you rose again, and by your, by your blood I'm cleansed, my sins are forgiven, by your grace I walk in victory, and by your promise I live in hope. Amen. Hope of the resurrection and the rapture. So here, Lord, I give myself to you. What a gift to give back in this Christmas season. I'm asking your musicians to come. On the day of his birth, Jesus was destined for a cross. The cradle was a mere stopover on the way to the cross. We see nothing from him after the age of two. It is believed that at the age of two, he was taken into Egypt until the death of that individual that wanted to destroy, the hero that wanted to destroy him. Then we see him at age 12 in the temple. We see him no more until about the age of 30. And then for three years, we see his life as he taught, as he called. 
as he defined his purpose. I, I, I don't see anywhere in the gospel where Jesus talked about his own humble birth. Isn't that interesting? I was born in the stable. And uh, the one who gave birth to me, the man she's married to, is not my father. You don't see that anywhere. At age 30, he came full of the Holy Ghost and revealed the love of God for us, culminating in his horrible death from man's perspective on the cross. But see, on the day of his birth, he was destined for a cross. On the day of his birth, he was destined for a cross. And you might call me a little strange, and you're going to be quite right. But I believe that every cradle that depicts Jesus in it should have a cross on the foot of the cradle. For that was his destiny. That's where he was headed for. Because he loved you and I. Yes, the church, the historical church, have messed up the Christmas message pretty bad. Pretty bad. But I'd like to say this morning. I think there's moments like this when we need to refocus our perspective on what Christmas is all about. That God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here this morning, you've not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want you to know He came. His humiliation was for you. His incredible life was for you. His, his, his horrible death was for you. And I use the word horrible there from, from man's perspective. Only from man's perspective. It was for you. It was for me. If you're here without him today, if you're watching by live streaming and you don't have not made Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to know this Christmas season that he came for you. He came for you. No matter where you're watching today in our great world, no matter what day it is or what time of the day it is, He came for you. And I would challenge all of us today, believers, to understand this truth that he's, as He gave His all for us, He calls us to give our all for Him. It's not a process that's going to happen immediately. It's not a process that's going to happen overnight. It's a process of discipline. It's a process of prayer and the Word. It's a process of desire where we want to draw closer to Him as believers. However, the process of, of, of salvation is instantaneous in the sense that if you believe in your heart that Christ Jesus is your Savior, you repent and you confess your sin and believe instantly. You go from death to life. That's the power of the Christmas season. The Lord tarries. We'll take our tree down. Our friends will go home. The gift wrapping will get burned up or put it in the garbage, whatever you do with it. The box that came in will get flattened out and maybe you can use it later on in the year. The gifts that were really applicable you'll use, many of them you will repackage and give to a friend on their birthday, hoping that it wasn't that friend that gave you the gift in the first place. It'll be all gone. But when we understand this truth, that we have Christ living in us by His grace, and you that are not saved, that have not made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, He came to redeem you. And you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, you will have a gift that will last for time and eternity. What an incredible Savior we serve. 
What an incredible Savior. If you're listening to my voice in this sanctuary or by live streaming, I'd like for you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're in the sanctuary, I'm going to invite you to come forward. We want to pray with you. We want to pray with you that you'll encounter the living Christ right this morning. Move into the Christmas season with an incredible, with an incredible sense of this Christmas. It's not the gift under the tree. It's the gift in my heart, in my spirit. We have those here that love you and care for you, and they're going to pray with you, give you some literature that's going to help you understand what's happened. Then we have lots of ministries here that we're going to plug you into those ministries to be taught and discipled. I'd like for the whole congregation to stand. If you're watching my live streaming and you're giving your heart to Jesus this morning, get, a, get in touch with us. We've had a good response from a number of areas in our live streaming. Get in touch with us so that we can and identify yourself so that we can come alongside of you, either physically or through email or social media. Don't miss the moment. Don't go through this Christmas without understanding this incredible truth that Christmas is all about eternal life in Christ Jesus. Pastor Mitch is going to lead us in an appropriate number. And we're going to celebrate with you here in this sanctuary or by live streaming. We're going to celebrate that Christ Jesus has come into your life. Amen. Just slip forward this morning. God's people here are praying for you. God's people will walk you through the process. Come alongside of you. I invite you to come. Thank you, Father. Touch the hearts of people here today. Father, teach the hearts of those that are watching my live stream. This incredible season, Lord, because you came. Lord, let the real meaning of Christmas penetrate all of our hearts. And those who have not made you Lord, this is their moment here in the sanctuary of our live streaming as we invite them to receive you as Lord and Savior. Christ calls you to come alongside of you and to pray and believe with you. What a gift awaits you today, the gift of God's salvation through Christ Jesus. That gift, amen.
Christ paid the penalty for your sin. Paid the, paid the way by his sacrifice for your eternal salvation. He offers you the greatest gift you'll ever have. The greatest gift you'll ever have. Oh, the love of God. Don't miss the moment. He has, he, has, he has laid up for us in heaven. He's laid up for you. He's laid up for you. Eternal life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Who can define the love of God? Who can define the love of God? Think about the love of God. We often use this term, I found Jesus. I didn't find Jesus. I was running as fast as I could to get away from him. He found me. But Here's the, here, here, here's the other matter. He found you. But here's the other matter of significance. He pursues you. He didn't just offer you one chance and then say, okay, you made your decision. No, no. He pursued each one of us. How many here this morning remembering the Spirit of God pursuing you when you were in sin? Look at this. That's right. Life was miserable. Nothing satisfied. Sleep wouldn't come at night. It would only come early in the morning when you were totally exhausted. What you, would, what you were enjoyed began to lose its pleasure. And you wonder why. Because God was pursuing you. Amen. We thank God for this young man that's come this morning. If there's others here, we, we just want to linger for a moment let you know that God loves you and God's pursuing you. If you've been under conviction and you came this morning and you, you're still here and you've not surrendered your life to Christ, He's going to continue to pursue you as He pursued us. And we invite you to come. Pastor, just sing a, a, a line or two of that one. I think it's an old George Bevan Shea song, Old Love of God. Oh, love of God. Oh, love of God. That's what Simeon saw. The love of God that would give Christ. The love of God to, that, uh, that stepped over the Jewish nation and included the Gentiles. That was what, that's what Simeon saw. That's what saved us. The love of God. That's what's here to save you this morning. It's here to save you that are watching my live, live streaming. Just bow your head and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Don't you feel secure this morning in the love of God? Father, thank you for that love that will save us individually and then place us into the great family of God. Thank you for the love that reaches out to those who are still rejecting you. I pray that the Spirit of God will pursue and in this season, Lord, the thousands will come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you that mercy rewrote our lives and mercy ransomed us and plucked us back from sure disaster. And this morning, Lord, we celebrate, not because there's a worthy bone in our body, because there's not, but we celebrate in the grace of God. We celebrate in the love of God. We celebrate in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for placing us in the family of the body of Christ. Father, I pray you'll go with us today. And Lord, as we return tonight for a great service to come together, Lord, and to preach and declare that Jesus is a divine healer, Lord, I pray that six bodies will be healed and relationships will be restored and grace will be poured out in, in divine healing manner upon those who come in faith tonight. So, Father, we invite all the folk back and, Lord, be present amongst us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Thank you.